Here we're going to start looking at the structure of the real numbers, starting with the least upper bound and the greatest lower bound. So a set A in R, so a subset of the real numbers, is said to be bounded above if there exists some U in R such that U is bigger than or equal to every A, which is in A. So in other words, it is above or equal to every element of the set A. And in that case, we will say that U is an upper bound. So obviously not every set will have an upper bound. In fact, the, all the real numbers don't have an upper bound um, because they go on infinitely large. And the subset of the integers inside the real numbers also does not have an upper bound, again, because integers get arbitrarily large. Then we've got a companion definition for bounded below. So we say a set A of R is bounded below if there exists an L in R such that L is less than or equal to A for all A in A. And here L is called a lower bound. So this means that we can find an element of the real numbers that is smaller than every element from our set A. Furthermore, we've got these special upper bounds and lower bounds called least upper bounds or greatest lower bounds or also supremum and infimum. And so S is said to be the least upper bound or supremum, or sometimes we'll just say sup, of A in R if S is an upper bound of A and if we have another upper bound of A, which is called U, U has to be bigger than or equal to S. And so notice that's going to make S smaller than or equal to every upper bound. Um, in other words, it's the least such upper bound. And we can have a similar definition for greatest lower bound. And it's actually a really good exercise to kind of uh, write that down as a companion to this uh, yourself. And just kind of by the way, in this case, we would generally say S equals soup A, so supremum of A. Okay, so now let's go ahead and look at some examples. So this first one is like kind of a picture example. So let's say we've got the real number line there, and our set A is shaded in pink. So notice that everything to the left of this point is a lower bound, so all of it. And then everything to the right of this point is an upper bound. And that's because we're assuming that we see all of A in this picture and there's no, no parts of A that are to the left there and no parts of A to, that are to the right there. So notice there are infinitely many lower bounds and there are infinitely many upper bounds. Like you could take this number right here, whatever it is as a lower bound, this one as well. But now let's notice that this single point right here is the greatest lower bound, or in other words, the infimum of A. So that's the largest such lower bound. And similarly, this open circle right here is going to be the least upper bound. In other words, the soup of A. And notice we have two things going on here. In this case, the nth of A is actually an element from A because we've got a shaded in dot there. But the soup of A here is not an element from A. And that's okay. Both of those are possibilities. Okay, so now let's look at an example with uh, an interval on the real number line. So minus 3 to 17. So notice we can make a list of lower bounds. In other words, numbers that are smaller than everything in that set. Well, it's going to be everything less than or equal to negative 3. So like negative 99, negative uh, 74, negative 10, negative 3. So those are all lower bounds. But there is a single greatest lower bound. So the nth or the greatest lower bound is obviously equal to 3 because every other lower bound is going to be less than this one. Now let's look at some upper bounds. So notice uh, there are infinitely many upper bounds too. So we could have like 20, 39, a million. So those are all uh, upper bounds because they're all bigger than every element from this, this set. But let's maybe look at another uh, upper bound, the least upper bound. In other words, the soup. So that's going to be equal to 17 because that's the smallest such upper bound. Okay, fantastic. So now I want to erase the board and maybe look at uh, one or two more examples before we prove an important result.
Let's look at these two examples. So the first one is the set of the reciprocals of all of the natural numbers. So notice we can write some of these out. So the first one would be one, then we have one over two, one over three, one over four, one over five, and so on and so forth. So we're not gonna prove that what we take to be the soup is the soup or what we take to be the nth is the nth, but um, it'll be pretty obvious. So let's see, the nth, in other words, the uh, greatest lower bound of this is going to be equal to zero. And notice, why is that? Because if we pick any number bigger than zero, we can find an n where 1 over n is less than that number. So that would make it no longer a lower bound. Okay, good. And so next, let's look at the soup. And so this would be uh, the least upper bound, and that's uh, kind of obviously 1. And that's because 1 is the biggest element from the set, and that's like pretty easy to see. Now let's look at this one, uh, b, which is m over m plus n, where m and n range from the natural numbers. So let's go ahead and kind of make a chart of this uh, to get an idea how the set works. So let's say m goes on the rows and n goes on the columns. So here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and now maybe 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, so let's see, m over m plus n. So on this first row, we're gonna have one over two, because we have one over one plus one. Now we're gonna have two over three, three over four, four over five, and then five over six. Okay, great. Now let's go along this first column. So m is one in this first column, and then the denominators are getting bigger. So we have one over three, one over four, one over five, one over six. Now let's see what we have here. Here m is fixed at two. So we're gonna have two over four because we have two plus two, two over five, two over six, two over seven. Now I think we can see where this is going. Notice here we're gonna have three over five, 3 over 6, 3 over 7, 3 over 8. So without proving, because we don't really want to prove for these examples yet, we'll do that uh, a bunch later in this class, we really just want to work our intuition. So notice, if it looks like as we go this way, we're approaching 1, so a good guess would be the soup, in other words, the least upper bound of this thing is going to be equal to 1, and then if we go down this column, we're going to be 0. So in other words, the nth of uh, b is going to be equal to zero. So there's a good guess for the supremum and the infimum of this set. Okay, now I want to clean up the board and give a proof of an important result about the soup. So this is an important classification theorem for the least upper bound. So it says that assume that S in R is an upper bound for a set A, then S is the least upper bound, the supremum of A, if and only if for all epsilon bigger than zero there is an A in A such that S minus epsilon is less than A. So let's look at the picture of this. So I've put A in orange. And then S here is the least upper bound. In other words, it's the supremum. Now notice if we do S minus epsilon, that lands us right here. And what this is saying is that for any epsilon, if we go over to here to S minus epsilon, we can always find an element from A that is bigger than that S minus epsilon. And that's true regardless of how small epsilon is. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the proof of this. So we're going to do this forward direction first. So let's go ahead and suppose that S equals the supremum of A and epsilon is bigger than zero. So we're given this epsilon bigger than zero. So now the next thing that we know is the following. So let's notice that S minus epsilon is less than epsilon. Great, but what that means is that it cannot be an upper bound of A. And by it, I mean S minus epsilon is not an upper bound of our set A. So going over here to the definition of an upper bound and negating that definition, we see that that means there exists some little a in a such that s minus a epsilon 
is less than A. Great. Because it's not an upper bound. If it's not an upper bound, that means there's something from A above it, and that will be this little a. But that's exactly what we wanted to show in this forward direction. Okay, so now let's move to the reverse direction. Okay, now moving for this reverse direction, we want to suppose that this thing over here is true. So in other words, let's suppose for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is an A in A such that S minus epsilon is less than A. So that's what we're starting with. And then the next thing that we want to do is show that S is the supremum. In other words, it's the least upper bound. We already know that it's an upper bound. It just needs to be the least upper bound. But let's go ahead and look at the definition of the least upper, upper bound of the supremum. One part of it is that it's an upper bound. Again, that's assumed. The next thing says if u is also an upper bound, then u is bigger than or equal to s. So that means that we're going to take u to be another upper bound of a. And then what we want to show is that u is uh, bigger than or equal to s, making s the least upper bound. Okay, so uh, let's maybe by way of contradiction suppose that uh, u is not bigger than or equal to s. That means u is less than s. Okay, we're doing this proof by way of contradiction. So the opposite of u being bigger than or equal to s would be u is less than s. Now if we get a contradiction out of this, we know that u has to be bigger than or equal to s. So we're taking u to be less than s, but what that tells us is that s minus u is positive, but let's just go ahead and set that equal to epsilon. So we have epsilon is equal to s minus u. Now the next thing that we know is by our assumption up here, there exists an A in A where A is less than S minus epsilon. So that means that S minus epsilon is less than A. But now let's go ahead and replace epsilon with what we have here. So we have S minus S minus U is less than A. But now notice that shows us that U is less than A. But that means u is less than an element from the set, but u was supposed to be another upper bound. So, but that contradicts the fact u is an upper bound. So that gives us our contradiction. So to reiterate, this u less than s led to a contradiction, which means we have to have u bigger than or equal to s. So if we have another upper bound, it has to be bigger than or equal to our given upper bound, making our given upper bound the least upper bound. Okay, good. So we're actually going to get more use out of this lemma than it might seem at the moment. Um, it's a pretty important classification of the least upper bound. So I'll clean this up and we want to look at one more thing before the end of the video. Finally, we want to look at this thing called the axiom of completeness. So it says that every non-empty set A of R with an upper bound has a least upper bound. Now this does not say that every subset of the real numbers has a least upper bound. That is not true. Notice the real numbers itself does not have a least upper bound. The subset of integers does not have a least upper bound. But if it has an upper bound to start with, then it has a least upper bound. So the important thing is that this distinguishes R from the rational numbers. So this is not true in the rational numbers. And we can actually give a couple of examples for that. So maybe the first example that I'd like to look at is this set A would be all rational numbers such that when you square them, you get something less than or equal to two. So this is gonna be bounded above by lots of stuff. Notice it's bounded above by three, it's also bounded above by two, four, it's bounded above by everything like that. In fact, it's bounded above by everything larger than the square root of two, but that does not have a least upper bound if Q 
Q is our universe because the square root of 2 is not inside Q. So notice soup of A here is equal to the square root of 2. That's pretty easy to see, but that is not in the rational numbers. So the rational numbers are not complete in that sense. Okay, so now I'd actually like to look at another example, and that example will be, let's define uh, this sequence, a n, where n uh, is in the natural numbers. So our subset is made up of this sequence, and a0 is equal to 3, um, a1 is equal to 3.1, a2 is equal to 3.14, a3 is equal to 3.141. So as you can see, we add another digit of pi after each spot. So here we can see that the supremum of our set, maybe we'll call this A again, is equal to pi, but pi is also not a rational number. So the rational numbers are not complete um, in this sense either. Okay, that's a good place to stop.